So I'm back from Europe, back in the studio. Got a recording session today. Yeah. What did this do? That's a kick drum. The pedal? Oh yeah, is uh -huh. that what they do? been a crazy week and I know I say that sometimes. This week in particular, I mean just last Monday we were in Cologne, Germany. Yeah. Played it in the bathroom and heard like the reverb and everything I thought this is really cool. <laughs> Tuesday, we were in Paris. <laughs> Wednesday, Tübingen, Germany, which was the last show of the tour. Thursday, it was back on a plane from Germany to London to Los Angeles. That was a long trip. Speaking of being in Europe, a huge, huge, ginormous thank you to each and every one of you who took the time to reach out to the booking agency, Good Music Company, and request that our band show up in your city. I know we didn't get to many of those places. You know, We didn't get to Glasgow. I know we didn't get to Vienna and so on and so forth. But um, wherever we got, we got because of you. I mean that 100% from the bottom of my heart. This tour would not have happened without you. So I'm eternally grateful for that. It was a lot of fun. It was a great success. And it really kind of turned the page a little bit from not being able to get any doors open to now people asking us to come back next year or next spring or, or whatever. So thank you, thank you very much. I got home that night just in time to see the kids for an hour and a half before bed. <laughs> It's uh, almost 10 p.m. I think I might be able to get eight hours of sleep tonight in my own bed. Actually, I had a, a great night's sleep that night. And then the next morning I was off to Dallas for a show with Snarky Puppy. So I'm at the airport headed to Dallas, but my flight is about three hours delayed, which means I'm gonna miss sound check and arrive about 6.30 p.m. And the doors for the concert in Dallas are at 7 p.m. So I'll miss dinner, sound check and dinner. Probably can't make it to the hotel. Uh, <laughs> Saturday morning, we had a very early lobby call because we all had to get back to Los Angeles for the Hollywood Bowl on Saturday. It's, uh, it's 4.30 on Saturday. The Hollywood Bowl show tonight. It's just after a week of not sleeping too much each night. It's catching up and mixed with the jet lag and everything. And so it's like I'm, I'll, I'll fall asleep for a couple of minutes and then freak out and think it's been two hours or something.
today we're doing a recording session with Jay's band, Ye Yenning's Quartet. I think this is the final session for that. Hi. What's up, uh, gentlemen? I'd put it like on the other side of the bed. Oh, uh, yeah. Hi. What's up, buddy? What's going on, How man? How are you? Welcome back. What up, man? Let me see what Hudson says hello. I want to come too. <laughs> come on. Hi, Jose. <laughs> Hi, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the same tempo, pretty much, and the same number of bars in the form. Basically, I'm just uh, got a lot of work to catch up on here and a lot of practicing. I f and as much as it was great to play every night for two and a half weeks and whatnot, but in some ways now I feel I'm just very aware of wanting to, to uh, refresh my repertoire, so to speak, and just looking forward to getting into the woodshed. Which brings me to this question um, that I got from Dan. When improvising, what is going on in your head? Are you analyzing your musicality, preempting the harmony, or just completely present in the moment? I find it difficult not to think too much when improvising. Any advice? Um, that's a great question, Dan, and I don't know. It's, it's a little hard to figure out, because when you're in the moment, you're in the moment. I know that I'm very aware when I am taken out of the moment, and that happens when, I'm, when I become too aware that I am thinking. So I should, should start by saying, in the best of scenarios, I'm not thinking, I'm just feeling. But there's this interesting thing where a lot of it depends on the music and the context, and I would say a lot of it is dependent on familiarity. So if, it's, if I'm playing along with a, a, a standard that I know well, and I'm playing to a, an Abersold play along, and I know the song really well, I can kind of probably be on autopilot, for better or for worse, often for worse. If I'm playing with a band and, you know, if I'm playing with Snarky and it's a song I know well, or it's my band and I know, I'm probably not thinking too much about anything other than just making music in that context. And what does that mean? That means trying to shape and develop melodic ideas, rhythmic ideas, interact with the other musicians that I'm playing with. Heck, even if it's a play along, you know, sometimes just the piano player comps something and you might be able to reflect that in, in your improvisation. And, and even though they can't, you know, do, react back to you, you're still creating music that is, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, reactive isn't really it, but, um, but you are in the moment, you are commenting on what's happening right then and there. I digress a little bit. Um, what am I thinking about? Hopefully I'm never thinking about specific chords or scales. And I'm not sure if I should say never. I mean, it's just, it depends. So like this stuff with Jay, I've got a lot of the repertoire memorized, but maybe not all the chord changes and whatnot. So maybe I'm reading it on the stand as we play. And you know, those chord changes will serve as both a visual and an oral guide. You know, the, the, the advantage to seeing them visually is it, it gives me some context for where I might want to take an idea. If I'm just, if, if there was nothing, if I didn't know the changes well, or I wasn't reading them, and I was 100% playing along to something by ear, well, that's a little bit different because then I'm all in reactive mode, meaning like I don't know what's around the next corner. So any music I'm making is going to be affected in a split second. Like I can't, I can't adjust in, until I've heard the music. So. I'll give you another example, playing like a song like Body and Soul. If you don't know the harmony to Body and Soul, that's gonna be difficult to land your phrases in elegant ways because there's so many harmonic shifts and it changes keys on the bridge and whatnot. If you do know the chord changes, then you can plan a little bit. It doesn't mean that I'm planning out my solo per se, it just means that I have an awareness of where I am in the form, in the harmony, and what choices are available to me based on that as I work my way through the solo. So if I'm developing an idea and I have a sense of the harmony, it's not so much that I'm thinking F minor, C7, flat nine, F minor, B flat seven, or E7 sus. I'm not necessarily thinking that. It's more that I kind of know where I am on the horn and I know kind of, I almost have a feel for what notes are available to me, what choices I have. And that only comes from a lot of thinking 
when I'm in the practice mode. So lots and lots of thinking when I'm in practice mode and hopefully almost no thinking, um, certainly not like front of mind thinking when I'm in performance mode. That's the ideal. That's what all the work, all the practice for me is about, is to get all of that stuff out of the way so that I can just be open to, to feel and hear the music in real time. But that only really happens if I have a really strong sense of the underlying harmony, form, rhythm, structure, all of those elements. So I'm not sure if that directly answers your question, but to be honest, I'm not sure if I can answer that question because I don't I'm not sure that I know exactly what the what the percentage breakdown of thinking and not thinking is for myself. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to be a listener first and a player second and create music that I would want to hear versus just things that I'm able to play. Keep forgetting to mention, we're about a month away from this summer's Inside Outside Saxophone Retreat. This year's special guest is Branford Marsalis. If you're not aware of the retreat, go check out InsideOutsideRetreat.com. Last year we had Chris Potter, the year before we had Joshua Redman, the year before we had Kirk Whalem. It's an amazing week out in the woods, about 40, 50 saxophone players. It's just a remarkable environment. Check out the website. Hope to see you there. Uh, yeah, and uh, we're back. Hey.